adaptability and innovation and really delve deep and to just shifting the way that we look at things. And it may not always seem in the grandest way, but those small incremental changes toward innovation adaptability, which make us every day more and more uh, nimble and able to accept change, not as an, as an interruption, but as an accelerator. So um, I had a very great introduction. I wanted you also to know, I've been in a couple of, of really great places over the years, um, healthcare, uh, finance, uh, some of the most regulated industries. So as I talk through this, I want you to know, I understand that adaptability and innovation do become a little bit more complicated in more regulated spaces, the government, for example. But um, I hope that during the Q&A, we're able to talk a little bit about some strategies to make the best out of your time in some of the higher, higher regulated industries and how to make innovation and adaptability part of the culture. I'm gonna get started on my presentation this day. Um, I will try to keep it as engaging as possible. It's gonna be really exciting for me to see your questions in the end. So please bear in mind, this is not meant to encompass any and all that there is to say about innovation and adaptability. This is really meant to start conversation and get you thinking in the right direction. So please do include your questions. I would love to interact with you. So um, as I go through this, please um, send us your questions as well. All right. And you should be seeing my screen now. And I just wanted to get confirmation that um, we are able to see my screen. I'm not sure if our amazing um, team could confirm um, if my screen is showing. I'm assuming so. All right, awesome. Yes, wonderful. We are live. You're able to see it. That's great. Awesome. All right, so let's talk about enabling a mindset of adaptability and innovation. We're going to go over a little bit of the House of Lean. What does it mean to be adaptable? What is adaptability? How COVID actually made adaptability in design a necessity, something to be necessary, not something to choose upon. And then innovation as a cultural shift, not innovation. We're talking about the innovation quadrant, the types of innovation, and how to enable a mindset of adaptability and innovation at every level. And we're gonna actually look at some examples. All right, so today's conversation is gonna be pretty much focused upon the innovation piece of the House of Lean. Look at innovative people, the time and space for innovation, the importance of going and seeing, experimentation and feedback, pivoting without mercy or guilt is one of my favorite things to say to all of my teams. You know, always, 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 if it's not working, just pivot. It's better to fail early, we know this, but how easily can we really do that in our environments? We're gonna talk about ways in which innovation doesn't have to be this painful large undertaking or something that you need to get extreme amounts of funding to make happen. We're gonna talk about how to pivoting without mercy and or guilt and still not make it into such a large financial undertaking for the enterprise. We're gonna talk about innovation riptides. All of these things are gonna be part incorporated into our conversation today. But I wanted to first define adaptability. Now, adaptability is simply the measurement of how well an organization can handle change. In design, it's a difference between a static design that's completely incapable of handling any change to something more dynamic, a dynamic design that can gracefully embrace change. You can see this often in teams that will not use any sort of variable design, that will not use any sort of variable um, uh, factors into the way that they're building their code, that would be strictly focused on these are the, these, these are the factors that I wanna use, these are the variables that I'm going to use, and I will not be able to be flexible in the way that my code is written. So in design, we're looking at more dynamic design over static design. In adaptability, you can also see it in uh, the most common apl application of adaptability is usually having some sort of approach sort of in the middle where we are adaptable, but only to a certain limit. Now, I want you to think about what happened recently in the world and what is still happening. During COVID, the companies that understood adaptability and were built to sustain change were able to thrive during COVID, while others did not. And I want you to think in your own experiences, what are some of these companies that you saw rise up to the top, be able to manage change, manage uncertainty, and almost come out as the winners of a very difficult time for all of us? Think of those companies, and I want to present to you one example that I was able to see almost immediately, and I always talk about them. 
What happens, for example, when you market yourself as a travel credit card, but there is no travel? How do you remain uh, part of a, a very changing uh, uh, landscape when it comes to credit cards and traveling and, and remain really present and forthcoming in the industry? you have to pivot. So adaptability looks like American Express. Uh, let's talk about the adaptability of play here. So American Express Platinum, uh, for those of you, this is not a sales pitch, by the way, I do not work for American Express, but I do have to definitely give them their kudos for this. Uh, during COVID, actually before COVID, American Express Platinum specifically, and I imagine all the other tiers as well, were very focused on travel benefits. Uh, airline credits, TSA pre-check, the global entry credits, hotel credits, global lounge access, Uber credits. They covered you at every turn. I think they even have something specific towards um, uh, even your lounge meals covered or something, uh, 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 something around that. But what I found really interesting was that after COVID or during COVID, they found themselves needing to focus more on remote living. So a travel credit card said, okay, travel's not happening. We have to remain uh, com uh, competitive. We have to adapt. We have to simply pivot. So they started to focus on remote living. So they switched all the credits around and now no airline credit or there was an airline credit, but I think they still don't know who was utilizing it. So all of a sudden there was a credit for grocery delivery services and Walmart Plus was part of it and other services. There was a credit for streaming services. You could have any of the streaming services and they would cover it every single month up to a certain amount. There was a shift that I thought was really fun from Uber credits to Uber Eats because none of us were going out to eat at the time. So they shifted from let's take you somewhere to let's get the food to you. Um, and it was this radical shift towards how do we continue to serve our customer base? when our primary selling point, which is we are the travel card for you, is not viable given the circumstances. And if a company isn't ready to accept change at every level, it's gonna be really difficult for them to be prepared to embrace changing conditions. It's very, very difficult if the sales team wasn't able to say, let's leverage some of these, uh, some of these relationships to our advantage. How can we continue to work with Uber? Maybe contractually we're required to, but can we pivot in a way that serves them and still serves us? All of those little changes require that we are adaptable to our environment. I imagine their development team had to create a new landing page for all of these new services. So it wasn't just development. It wasn't just IT that had to pivot quickly. It was everyone from sales to marketing to development, everyone connected to each other to be able to embrace the changing conditions around them. Now, adaptability is probably one of the easiest catalysts to innovation. Change is the fastest accelerator. I imagine all the companies that refused to ever support remote working were forced to do so under COVID. But those companies who had already embraced the technology necessary to allow for remote working saw an easier transition to fully remote. But these, COVID was truly the massive accelerator that we all needed. We saw companies embrace technology that they were completely reluctant to apply, jump on it as quickly as possible. We saw the rise of Zoom and WebEx and other like, uh, other like technologies. The truth is that without every level of an organization built to withstand change, innovation then becomes more of a task to be completed oh, we have to innovate upon this, or in my innovation sprint, I have to make time to innovate, whatever that means. But when innovation and adaptability in everything that we do, if we build space to pivot in any direction and every step of our, 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 our process of creating value, then it becomes just a cultural, a culture to be adopted not a task to be completed. Now, a company's culture is going to be key for their success and innovation. One of the main things that the House and Leaf focuses on is innovative leadership. It's difficult to speak innovation, it's difficult to speak adaptability when the leadership in place does not understand the value of these things. We're going to get into some examples of what that looks like and how we can start innovating, not in a large scope, but even in small steps within what we are able to influence today in whatever your position may be. Now, let's talk about this. Innovation is not always a grand change. I, I want to say that every time I speak to a team and I bring up the topic of innovation, 
they cringe. They literally are so worried to talk about it because they don't know how to tackle the large issues that their team is facing or their organization is facing. But the reality is that innovation isn't always a grand change. We have some major disruptors that have innovated beyond what some of us could even think of. Uber is a great example of innovating the taxi industry. But there are other smaller innovations, everyday innovations, everyday changes that are simply the introduction of something new. So when we talk about innovation, I don't want you to become overwhelmed with the idea that it has to be a grand change. Innovation is simply the introduction of something new. And I want to take you into this very important slide during this conversation. And I hope that wherever you are, you either take a screenshot of this or if you've seen it before, you bear with me while we talk about some opportunities here. We're going to talk about the quadrant of innovation or the innovation quadrant. If you've seen this before, great, you're going to hear about it again. But if you haven't, today's going to be a great opportunity to look at ways in which we can incorporate small steps towards something new, a new way to do things without necessarily being the next Uber or the next uh, HelloFresh or the next Chewy, right? We don't have to disrupt an entire you know, an, an entire marketplace in order to bring about a sustainable change, right? So looking at the squadron is going to look into the impact on the market going up on the side, and then on the other axis, technology newness from low to high. So I want to start on the low end of technology newness. This will be our low hanging fruit. This is where we can introduce technology without needing a vast amount of new technology available to us. But we have to also notice that the impact on the marketplace varies. If we're doing incremental innovation, we're looking at a low impact on the market and a low technology newness required. If we're looking at sustaining, we're looking at a low technology newness required and a higher impact on the market. Let's take a look at what the difference is between the two. Now, incremental is just a gradual, continuous improvement on existing products or services. Great example of this, if any of you, I'm gonna use specific examples, by the way, as we go through this, because I have observed some some great examples in the industry today. Um, take a look at cell phone companies. That's an incremental change. And in think about the way they change their plans, their phone plans. We started with initially, uh, you could only call on weekends for free or after a certain hour for free. And you had, and I think text messaging wasn't even a focus, let alone data, but they could they could kind of cap you and get some extra money there on, on how you manage your calling because that's where the focus was. But as the generation started to focus more on texting and data, the basic plans changed from, uh, okay, so now we're not gonna manage how much you talk, Talk is free. Let's let's all just allow all types of, of, of talking unless it's international. Um, we're gonna give you limited text messages and a limited data as the highest form of plan, although you could have lower data plans below that. So now the focus shifted from let's 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 manage calling to let's manage data. So it's an incremental change. It happened little by little as the market was evolving. They started to offer different services, started to change what their service looked like to go with the times and go with the different changes in generations. Now, a sustaining change, which is a significant improvement on a product that aims to sustain the position in the existing market. I think a perfect example of this would be someone who would be considered a disrupt, uh, disruptor like Apple. But think about just the sole product of iPhone. So if you look at the iPhone when it first came out, it was nice. It didn't have all the bells and whistles that it has now. But over the years, they've been able to maintain their place in the marketplace by figuring out a way to include not a large newness in technology. If you look at the last couple of iPhones, the changes are minimal around screen resolutions, uh, uh, the camera the quality. But the foundation of the iPhone hasn't necessarily shifted drastically. They're just sustaining their place in the marketplace. Now, how they innovate, that small space of innovation, not necessarily leveraging that much newness, allows them still to have something fresh to offer to their, to their customer base every year. So they're in a sustaining us, they're sustaining their innovation place. Whereas an incremental place, which is a great, a great example, that would be phone companies, right? Now, if you shift over to the right, we look at disruptive and radical changes. So radical changes will be our high technology newness, but a low impact on the market. And what does that look like? Technolo technological breakthroughs that transform industries entirely, and they create a new market. I think a radical change in an industry would be something like crypto, where immediately you might think, oh, that's not, I don't see how that's a low impact on the market. But I mean, I imagine when it first started, it was something, and still to this day, something that many regard as 
dangerous, difficult to understand. So it might not have an immediate impact on the market, but over time, because it's a radical new existence of a new market and requires new technology, a lot of new technology, it will eventually go into a place where the impact of the market is much higher. But if you think about what it took T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon to go from offering free phone calls on weekends to all phone calls are available and you know all calling is free, let's manage data and let's manage your texting and your data usage. That's a bit more incremental, might not require as much technology as it is to create an entire crypto market. When you look at disruptive, you're looking at technology of new businesses models that disrupt the existing market. This is where all your Netflix, your Ubers will fit. This is your high technology newness requirement and a high impact on the market. I would say that when we think of technology, we go straight to disruptive technologies. We, we go straight to thinking of who's gonna be the next Netflix? Who's gonna be the next Tesla? Who's gonna be the next Google? And while all of these companies did a beautiful job at showing us what disrupting a, a, a marketplace looks like, it's not until we harness the understanding of how to be incremental in our innovation that we can ever get to disruptive and radical. If we understand how to start small in, in existing technologies, all of these emerging technologies are a little bit different, but we're harnessing the idea of innovation everywhere. So if you are in an existing marketplace, a place that's not a brand new technology, no one, it's not a startup, you're, you're looking at an age old industry like banking or healthcare, you might think, well, I don't know how to be, uh, how to make a major disruption. I'm gonna take years. I have no place for innovation today. I would say focus on incremental innovation, focus on sustaining innovation. Where you are and when, in the scope of your influence, what can you do to shift the needle forward in the way that we do things? The question is always, is there a better way to do what we're doing? Based on the changing marketplace and the changing customer base, think about new generations coming of age. What should we be thinking about? What is the new way in which we should do things that would allow for incremental innovation to take place? And as you go into a place of allowing incremental innovation, it will position you perfectly to have a culture that when disruptive or radical technologies come into play will not be as shocked because incremental sustaining innovation has been already part of the everyday approach. Sometimes when we look at disruptive technologies, we think that our industries will never be part of that, or that there is no way that in our roles or in our scope of influence, we could ever impact disruptive or radical technology changes. But I am sure that in whatever your scope of influence is, you can introduce incremental, incremental innovation, sustaining innovations and ideas where your teams can adopt a different way of looking at common problems. Now, let's take a look at some examples. I think I talked a little bit about this example, but something that I thought was really interesting is the way the health industry uh, adopted a system that was in place, as telemedicine was, but really, really embraced it when it came to COVID and remaining uh, remaining uh, present in a, in a time where um, going to the doctor uh, was pretty limited unless you had a dire situation at hand where um, uh, the labor crisis made it so that there wasn't the personnel available to necessarily see you in person, either for personal reasons allow, uh, in terms of COVID or because they simply were not you know, available. There just wasn't any anybody to, to help. But telemedicine made it so that I could see a doctor in Michigan, even though I am in Virginia, where I could see uh, where my coach was in D.C., my health coach is in D.C., but I'm in Virginia. And you're able to provide services to a larger scope by sustaining to creating a significant improvement to an existing product that aims to sustain your position in a changing marketplace. That's a great example of that. Now let's look at the types of innovation. I love this page. And if you want to take a screenshot of it, if you've seen it before, wonderful. I hope that um, we're in our conversation, you get a little bit more out of this. But these are the 10 types of innovation that I'd like to discuss with my teams. We look at where innovation is present beyond the technology space, beyond the just of the Ubers and the Googles, but where in an everyday operation of a business, could we ask the question of what else could we do? How could this be better? And I'm going to go through all 10 of these, and I'm going to try to give you examples of companies that have been successful making some of these changes, or examples that might help you align what you do with the opportunities available for innovation. 
Now, profit model. So the config, there's going to be three quadrants or three sections here, configuration, offerings, and experience. Configuration is going to start with profit models. Think about the way in which every company makes money. How can we innovate upon our profit, mo profit model? Netflix is a great example. I remember when if I wanted to watch a movie, I had to put it in a queue. I had to then request it. It would come in the mail. I would watch it. And then I had a timeline to return it before I was charged. And I also remember when that profit model changed and it went through, here is a uh, variety of streaming services and this is our focus now. And we no longer service these DVD deliveries. So their profit model shifted without changing their base focus, which is how do we make entertainment available, movies available, shows available to our base. What changed was their approach at their profit model and I love to make that comparison because when I talk to a, a younger generation, they have no idea what I'm saying. My sister's only eight years younger than me. And when I tell her that we used to get DVDs in the mail for Netflix, she's absolutely mind blown. I think the only thing she knows when it comes to DVDs and things like that is a red box. She never met a block. She was never there for Blockbuster. She has no idea what I was talking about. But seeing the profit model change for Netflix is one example when innovation could take place in the way that we consider where our profit comes from. Um, network, connection with others to create value. A good example of this you see in the banking industry. You see the way that they have integrating Zelle, Venmo, PayPal as a way to transfer money uh, actively, immediately from one account to another. Most banks will offer something of the sort, an integration with any one of those to then create the value of instant transfers across individuals. Um, if you're in Europe, this might not necessarily be that powerful of a change because I've heard you guys have open banking and that's so much more fun than what we have in the US. But in the US, those integrations, those network integrations with Cell and Venmo, PayPal are what makes it possible for us to be able to transfer money instantly from a single or simple banking account. Think of structure. What is the alignment of your talent and assets and how can it be changed? How can it be new? How can it be different? Structure and process is, is when we get to process, you see that this is where an agile methodology comes into play very often. The alignment of your talent and assets, if you think about structuring, think about the structuring of agile teams, uh, the breaking down of silos through agile release strains, uh, to creating cross-functional teams that used to be functionally aligned or capability only, where they were only supporting this payment solution or this specific uh, technology are now being brought together and creating a different alignment of talents and assets. And that in and of itself is a form of innovation, is a new way to look at how we go about our talent and the available assets at our disposal. Look at process. What is the signature or superior method for doing your work? This is where I mentioned that methodology, the agile methodology impacts structure and process as an innovation piece often. Because the way that we went about work before agile methodologies or in other methodologies was very different. How we go about the methods that we utilize to software development to business agility is also a shift towards innovation, even though we may not look at it in that way. These two spaces are often where agile methodologies would impact severely your structure and your process. Now let's look at product performance and product systems. Now for product performance, think about distinguishing features and functionalities. Think about the products that are out there that are trying to differentiate themselves one from another. Think about the way Samsung creates a phone, iPhone has its own, but they're trying to create and support different features year over year that will continue to make themselves important in the marketplace, but would create a differentiation between the two brands. But product systems is an interesting other way to look at this. And that's complementary products and services. Now think about cable companies, the way that they would make it so that your phone, your internet are all sort of perfectly aligned together and they work so great together and they want you to bundle that up and consider we can make your life easier if you just allow us to supply all of these product systems that are available to us. So it's creating complementary products and services to maybe your existing one product that may have been um, you know, a phone line originally, or maybe it was cable originally, offering these other things that have been proven to be complementary and often bundled or, or create an ease for the user. 
how do we create those product systems? How do we look at our main product offering and say, well, what goes well with that? And how can I maybe improve upon my offering here? One thing that another thing that is perfect, a perfect explanation or a perfect example of this is the, the afterpay kinds of systems out there. How, um, how the retail e-commerce space has now included, okay, here's a week are offering you this product, we're offering you this line of items that we know you want. There may be some financial hindrances that keep you from having them. Let us partner with someone else that can offer a complimentary product to what we're giving you. And that complimentary product is the ease of financing. So now I can multiply your payments. I can divide it over a certain amount of time. I increase my profit because I'm making it easier for you to obtain this. And I'm also offering you a multitude of services. So for some people, it may be a requirement that when they go out to an e-commerce and they go out to look for anything online, they're thinking if it doesn't have an afterpay option, if it doesn't have a multi-payment offering, I can't shop here. It's not available to me. This is the best and most affordable uh, way of me to, uh, to have this item, to have this service, to have this product. And so we might not look at interactions or integrations with other systems as creating a product ecosystem, but it could be a way to get there. Partnership is a great way to create a product ecosystem. Now let's look at all the experience pieces. Now this is how, what our customer experience looks like and how our innovation changes their everyday engagement with the brand. Now let's look at service, support enhancement that surround your offerings. I think more valuable during COVID than any any change in, 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 the, in, the, in the technology landscape or in the, any marketplace was how they were able to support, how every company was able to support um, their customer base through changing environment to a changing environment. And I've known of many, many friends, including, you know, uh, millions of articles talking about how customer service became so pivotal during COVID that people were changing all types of, 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 of providers based solely on how they were treated through a difficult time. So it was a moment to either shift how we supported our customers or lose them. And some companies did a great job at supporting the customer service transition. Other companies did not. But those enhancements that we offer at the customer line level, as a customer service, even to our own people and customer service, the technology we offer them to manage everyday operations are key to both sustaining and maintaining our people and contain and maintaining our customer base. Something that I love to talk about is uh, how technology makes customer service easy every day. In fraud detection, I learned recently of an amazing software that will actually take the voice uh, conversations of a person on the other side of the line and will transcribe them for the fraud agent and will allow them and um, it would allow them um, to then say, okay, these are the words that I heard from, um, from the person on the other side of the line. And maybe if I were on my own with no technology support, I would have to write out, type out everything that I'm hearing and hope that I didn't miss anything. But this software will transcribe the conversation and allow the customer service rep to follow along what was said to them. And so in fraud, this becomes really important because while some companies were being extremely flexible during COVID with certain mispayments, fraudulent transactions, and they were trying to offer the best support, there were also a large base of people that may have been trying to take advantage of that circumstance. So seeing that fraud uh, conversation transcribed was the ability, gave the every single one of the customer service associates the ability to compare what they were hearing and number one, confirm that they were speaking to the actual owner of those accounts. Number two, confirm that in fact, they were dealing with fraudulent transactions by simply comparing what they were hearing from what was being transcribed and the consistency in the storytelling thereafter. So how technology helps and supports our customer service base is extremely important. Um, channels, how your offerings are delivered to customers and users. Um, I think one of the best, and I think it, co it connects a little bit with customer engagement in a little bit, is that how brands have changed the way that they create a customer experience. Channels like Twitter are now easier to engage a brand if you have an issue than calling customer services. If I want an immediate response from anyone, uh, from, from my who services, my, my dog's medicines, to my own medicine being delivered, and I'm not getting a response from customer service, it takes about two seconds to go on Twitter 
ask their customer service support and get an immediate answer. And that is a channel improvement. That is an innovation that saw them not just going to social media to protect their brand reputation, but also to engage with the customer base. And with the changing, um, with the changing, um, uh, with, with the changing times and with the changing uh, generations, those channels are going to become pivotal because my sister generation, generations before her, are not fond of calling a customer service agent, but they might be a lot more inclined to use social media as a way to engage with brands. So changing the channels that we utilize to engage are very important. Brand. Represent, representing your offerings and businesses. I think a key innovation upon a brand representation would be Facebook. How they went from Facebook to the meta, metaverse, right? They used to be Facebook, WhatsApp. That's what we associate with that brand. It's social media. It's an, an opportunity to connect with like-minded individuals, but now it's creating an alternate digital environment to an alternate universe, a metaverse. And so that is a key innovation upon a brand that completely changed their identity. Customer engagement, distinctive interactions that you foster is how do we keep our engagement with the customer distinctive and aligned to how the changing how our changing environment um, is, is headed. If we're in the middle of COVID, we realized that customer representation on the phone was diminishing across almost all companies. So many companies sought to include text messaging and, and inclusion with text messaging and Apple, where I can talk to Delta, I can talk to American Express over text, because what they saw is that a single customer representative can hold one call at a time, but they could engage with multiple users across multiple channels if it's not a voice interaction. So changing that customer engagement, that distinctive interaction with your customer as the environments change, is gonna be pivotal, not just now during COVID, but I foresee in the future as the younger generations come of age and become a new uh, client base for many industries. Now, how to enable any of this innovation or adaptability where we find ourselves? I believe that it starts with asking ourselves key questions. So we're gonna go over some questions that may spark some, some thoughts in, as, as we go through this. And please understand this can apply in any place where you find yourself. You do not have to be the CEO of a company to start small. So let's start looking at some questions. A few questions to ask regardless of what you or what role you play in the transformation. The first one is, are we creating time and space for innovation? And are we planning for it? I think most teams fail as they go into innovation sprints if they have it, or as they go in the preparation for a hackathon, if they even have the opportunity to do that, is that if the time and the space is not carved out for innovation as is in the innovation sprint, there will never be a time or there may never be a time where we actually stop to analyze the way that we go about our everyday business and the opportunities that we may have to change how we do that, to introduce newness into the process. So innovation sprints are not just a time and a space. If you plan for it, if you actually pick out issues, everyday issues that your team is facing and you have them log it, you have them keep track of it. You say, all right, let's pick the top issue in our backlog that we're facing today or opportunities for change that we have discovered in our everyday work. And we actually plan to just solve for one of those things. You don't have to boil the ocean, but you can start with a glass of water. So what is one thing that your team has identified in the last three, six, you know, eight months working together, weeks working together, years working together, create a backlog of opportunities and go over those. Try to prioritize them. Ask your team, what is the one thing that we could change right now that may not be extremely expensive but will make a huge impact in our everyday work or could build up to be a greater impact over time? Definitely create space, time for innovation, but also plan for it. Is there a better way to go about this X thing? Is there a better way to go about hiring processes, application development, client retention, customer service, or any other internal or external product or service? Another thing that I hear often is, well, what if I am you know, working in a team that doesn't really face a client and it's not necessarily impacting an outside customer? What if my customer is the employee, there are the employees of the company? I'm in HR. How do I go about this? Whether it is an external or internal service or product, it's really important that we realize that there's always opportunities to change the process in which we engage with all of our constituents, whether in all of our client base, whether it's external or internal. So just ask yourself, and I think one of the key things to do here is elicit feedback. 
Uh, when my teams are saying, well, I don't know what needs to be changed. I think everything that we're doing is great. I turn it back on them and say, have you asked the people that are at the end, are receiving the end value of what you're doing today? How does your end user feel about the way that you go about these things? Ask them. Sometimes the team in and of itself may not be able to recognize where our process is falling short of serving the end user, but the end user would possibly be able to tell us. Now, internally, this may be a lot easier than externally, but I'm sure there's partnerships that we can leverage to elicit that feedback and know how are we how are we doing in this area? How, how did you like the experience on our website? How did you like the app? Can you rate us? Can you tell us about this? And eliciting that feedback is one of the greatest ways to build that innovation backlog and say, well, we heard from the customer this, from our internal or external customer, this is what we heard. Now we need to try to prioritize it based on where we can get the most value fastest, right? And try to tackle it during the time that we have an innovation and planning. And if more comes out of that innovation and planning, can we prioritize it with the rest of our stories? Can we build a backlog that includes innovation items from the get-go and not wait until the very end to figure out what to do during innovation and planning? Now, what are some incremental or low technology newness, low market impact innovations that I can support in my role that would allow for long-term enablement of adaptive thinking and give way to innovation as a culture. So way to an innovation as a culture, meaning leading to a more disruptive or radical innovations that have more high technology, more high on market value. Those steps that we take towards integrating technology or, or innovation in our everyday life, just thinking about what is a new thing, what is a new way in which I can do this everyday task is already an introduction to greater disruptions in the space. If we can build a group, if we can build an organization that is not inflexible to innovation, that it's welcoming of small incremental changes, it might be the perfect way to give way to larger innovation in the long term, or even quicker than you would expect. But if we don't start to build upon the question of how can we do this better? And what is a new way to go about this? What is a better way? How can we simplify this process? If those questions are not being asked today as we face uh, client feedback, internal feedback, then we're missing a key opportunity to create a culture of innovation that is innate to the organization and not necessarily forced upon, doesn't feel like a bunch of tasks to be done. All right, a couple other questions. A few questions to ask regardless of what role you play in the transformation. Within the scope of your influence, what can we do? What can I do to teach my team or teams to be proactive about opportunities to introduce a new way of doing things? Three questions that I, three things that I think about often is simplification. How can we simplify this? Automation, how can we automate this? And third way is, is there existing technology that we are not leveraging today? Is our technology stack outdated? Is there, is there someone, is there a partner out there that we could engage with that can make any of these things better? So those are things that come immediately to my mind as I'm, I'm trying to challenge my teams to, to think what are proactive ways that we can attack the issues of the opportunities that are available to us today. What opportunities or forums do I have available to me to start a conversation of adaptability and innovation? Another thing that I hear often is no one's hearing me. No one cares about what I think. I don't have anyone. I don't have anyone important uh, I don't, uh, to, to talk to about these changes. I don't want anyone. I don't have the ear of those that are there to make major changes. But the reality is that we probably all have a forum or two or opportunities available to us where we could just begin the conversation. Hey, how can we do this better? I love to just come into a COP and say, here's an issue. Um, there you go, that's the issue, we need to solve for it. And just hear people sometimes ramble, but sometimes land in really great answers to the question at hand. And once you start presenting the problem and seeking out the solutions, even from those other knowledge workers that are, that are you know, alongside with us, you know, trying to push the transformation at, a, at, a, at an enterprise level, you might hear new ways of doing things that might have never been considered. And so eliciting feedback from those other agilists within our organization, um, external agilists from our customer base internally or externally, might lead to a great conversation in whatever forums you have available to you on how we can include adaptability and innovation in everything we do wherever you find yourself. Finally, what are some opportunities I have discovered for disruption in our space? Now, 
innovation may start, like I said, very small, but sometimes the major innovation ideas that you hear are pretty disruptive in nature. I remember being part of a hackathon where a team thought about virtually uh, placing furniture in, um, in an apartment complex. And so we were in the uh, real estate industry and they actually hacked this idea of what if we put virtual furniture, what if we allow people the ability to put virtual furniture into a space just to see if it would work for them. And at the time, it, it seemed kind of transformative and brand new and no one would do anything like this and seemed like a lot of money behind it, but they managed to get it done in two days. And I was extremely mind blown by this team. But soon after they did that, I started to see the same concept in a million other places in, in the way that I shop for my furniture and I'm able to do a virtual reality view of what it would look like in my house. I can now actually go to a rental space and try out my furniture in the active space. So disruption in every space really begins with, think about the problems that you face, think about the opportunities that you have discovered and take that route first. Now, I wanted to give you a working example. You know, of, of this comes from a company that was already adopting, had already adopted Agile, um, thought itself to be, you know, very uh, Agile in, in the terms of their information of business agility, but had a really interesting problem at hand. And this problem came directly from the recruiting team. They had a large, uh, they were in a large healthcare company, um, and they had two key issues. Number one is an overwhelming number of submissions for the roles that were available but a small number of recruiters available to support those submissions. Now, each recruiter would have to review each individual one, each individual application one by one. They didn't have a way to read over that, that was quicker, that was automated. They didn't have anything available to them at the time. Now, the volume of applicants had given all the available recruiters very little time to do any active recruiting. They had to rely on just posting the job and hope for the best. Obviously, this led to an overall employee uh, dissatisfaction or satisfaction really crumbled for this particular team. Mm. And while there was budget for one more recruiter, there was the overall sense that adding one more body wouldn't necessarily impact the issue of, you know, the recruitment or easing the recruitment process at all. So we had an innovation session in this team and we had some, we asked some questions and we started to, and it doesn't just involve your team for questions like this. Um, radical changes that may be a little bit beyond just the recruiters themselves, we had to include their leadership. But these questions came about and these were the solutions that this team came, came, up, came with. Now, is there a better way to go about the review of so many applications, so many applicants? And then what the team decision was, was to take the budget available for the new recruiter and consider the cost of existing technology. So think of newness of technology here is very low because this is existing technology, I don't have to create it from scratch. So newness of technology on the quadrant, very low. Existing technology for applicant screening, and we found a myriad of opportunities and a million options for them to engage with. So we went deep into finding the best partner. The next question was, are there any enhancements that in our partnerships that we have today for recruiting that we could leverage? Um, if we're using LinkedIn, if we're using other forums, are there enhancements, are, are, there, um, are there any other ways in which we could go about recruiting better? Could, what else is available to us? Maybe the way we're going about job posting is not helping us either. And so what the team did is that they decided to partner, I believe with LinkedIn at the time and start advertising um, the key jobs and also use a professional membership for recruiters. They, I think they also use specifically specific keywords to find the people that they needed and the recruiting process eased mm -hmm. quite a bit. So they both integrated a new partner for um, uh, applicant screening, and they were able to partner with existing you know, outlets that they were utilizing for job posting to both increase their ability to read more applications at once and do some active recruiting. Now, in the end, these two things took some time. This wasn't overnight. There was some budget approval for the new, uh, new technology. There was some changes to be made in the way that we engage for, with partners that were posting our jobs took about six months, give or take, to have a really solid change and shift in the way that they did their work. But ultimately, their satisfaction went through the roof. They were able to eventually hire more people. But before they did that, the automation of job screenings, of application screenings, was a huge help. They were able to hire more, more quality applicants were selected. So overall, swift shift into one direction changed drastically how this team went about it. Now, finally, this is my last word to you. 
in order to enable a mindset of adaptability and innovation, we just have to recognize the opportunities that are available to us. Prepare to challenge the way things are and make space to innovate and make, let's just make way for newness, big or small. That's it. That's all that I have. I think I have some questions here. Thanks, Lenny. There was one question from a participant who was asking about when you presented the 10 points for innovation, 10 types of innovation. He was talking about security. Oh, security. Are we talking security from the perspective, I imagine, of cybersecurity? Yeah. Right? Okay. So let's go back. So while security isn't listed here, one way in that I would personally introduce security here, if I had to tell you where I would think it goes, I would think it would be a network. Somewhere in network, I would talk about security. Um, because when we, depending on what you are in cybersecurity, I'm not an expert, but some of the teams that I work with have leveraged uh, different types of technologies to go about the way that they support our single sign-on, a verification of our credentials. Usually shifting an innovating network doesn't always have to be, and this is an issue that I see with a lot of the teams that I've worked with in, um, in, um, in cybersecurity, is wanting to solve all the issues internally, fearing a lot of integration with external parties, and fearing perhaps the process that it takes to get any of those external parties approved to be worked with. But when I see the teams that have been able to do single sign-on, Okta Verify, other, other partners, the way that they incorporate security, I think would fall under uh, and improvements in security, I think would fall within network and connections with others to create value, as well as looking into our process and our structure for innovation ideas. So the methods that we're using to do our work and the alignment of the, of the proper talent to do it. 